this session is going to discuss food security and the global food system challenges and opportunities. So we are going somewhat more global now. And we have two speakers. One is Dr. Marco Sanchez uh, and Dr. Tommaso Fernando. Uh, I would uh, introduce, I mean, uh, Dr. Marco is the first speaker. Uh, he's, uh, he's from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO. Uh, he's a deputy director of the Agri-Food Economics at FAO, where he directs the flagship reports the state of food security and nutrition in the world and um, the state of food and agriculture. Previously, he's an economist and previously he was senior economist at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Wealth Affairs and economist at the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean. Um, he is um, written uh, extensively, he has published extensively and his recent articles feature in World Development, Journal of Environment and Development, Food Policy, and Journal of Applied Economics. Um, the title of his uh, talk is, Is the War in Ukraine the Culprit for the Looming Global Food Crisis? A Deep Dive into the Real Drivers. So over to you, Dr. Marco. And um, you have 20 minutes. And would you like to have the questions immediately after that or yeah okay yeah so 20 minutes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, I'm trying to now, uh, basically, I will be uh, zooming zooming out from from, you know, the very if I may put it that way, very local, localized uh, issue that we were discussing around Russia and Ukraine, and, and zooming out to what it means uh, in, in the way the FAO and other UN agencies looked at the issue of food security and nutrition in the world. And it's all connected, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, my, my idea here is to show, I mean, uh, perhaps both, uh, how, the, how the war reminds us of something that was already in the making. Because everybody talks about the world as, as if it's something like it's new. It's, uh, you know, you, you basically uh, alluded to the issue of, uh, is this something that reminds you of something that already we had in the past, right? Uh, so basically what I will do is uh, very quickly, uh, see how I move this. Okay, so basically what I want to do here is uh, talk a little bit about the war, uh, just to show how it's what I call the, the tip of the iceberg, uh, but then move to what I believe and the FAO believes is the key drivers of global food insecurity and malnutrition, uh, provide some policy recommendations that, I, that are very important to keep in mind because some of the, of the previous speakers talk about the, the short term and the long term, and rightly so, uh, but, but they, are, they should be together. It's not like I can just focus on the short term and then think like, like the long term is different. Uh, you know. So things like that will be covered during my presentation that will provide a conclusion. So basically, uh, I think here, I was told I had 25 minutes. Now I was told I have 20 minutes. Uh, probably I already wasted two minutes. Uh, but uh, so maybe, maybe I should skip some of the numbers because some of the previous speakers were very eloquently referring to why, uh, you know, Ukraine and Russia are important. Why, why are these two players influencing the world through the war in direct and indirect ways, right? Uh, but but just, just look at this graph. I mean, it's, it's amazing because we, we, we thought about globalization in the past, we talk a lot about trade, but still you have players that can disrupt everything, you know? Uh, even though we have been talking about these things for, for many decades. Uh, here, for instance, you have a picture that shows Ukraine and the Russian Federation as key players for global food production. And you take out some flower seed, for example. So between these two guys, you already have covered 50% of that production for that product. So it's, it means something, right? So it, 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 this, is, this is the departing point for, for the war. And of course, then everybody should talk about this. And I'm just putting the example of some flower, but you have barley, wheat, etc. So, so, but, uh, 
but then if, if you look at the picture of, of, for example, Ukraine and Russian Federation and as important sources of global food supplies, and if you take the wheat, the barley, the maize, all these commodities, you will find out that in many of these, Russian and Ukraine are in the top 10. So then we have a problem, right? We have a problem, of course, and the world will, will basically lead us all to talk about it like we are doing today here. But then uh, I had many good, many good graphs for you, but I, don't, I cannot show them all. And this is comes from a studies that FAO just recently published on the war. Uh, let, me, let me move to fertilizers because somebody was talking about fertilizers as well. It's not only about food. Let me see if this is uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, this is a graph that is very, very interesting, you know, because it basically shows, again, that if you take if you take the first types of fertilizers that, that agriculture relies upon, then Russia is in the top 10 players in the world. So it's not just about food, you know, but it's also about fertilizers. Uh, and that's a problem as well, because it, it basically people think about the market right now, but I'm thinking about the next crop season, right? And then I'm thinking about yields, and then I'm thinking about how, if people don't have fertilizers, what does it mean for soil use? What does it mean for climate change, you know, for natural resources, for environmental sustainability? It has a lot of repercussions. It's not just about prices. So, uh, so then that's another problem. Uh, if you take, for example, you just look at this graph. Uh, this is, uh, shows how some countries are heavily relying on fertilizer imports from the Russian Federation. You take Mongolia, for example, almost 100% of the fertilizer that they import come from Russia. So that's a problem for a country that you know, relies on these fertilizers. And then you have you know, a decreasing uh, order there, a ranking, but still you have maybe 10 or 12 countries where you don't have the fertilizer coming from Russia, then agriculture is in trouble. And not only agriculture, but all the natural resources that you need to produce crops. Uh, now, this takes me to an important point that I wanted to make. Uh, which is on prices. Of course, the, the water erupts, and then everybody talks about the prices, right? It's obvious, there's an impact on prices. But the point I wanna make here is that the prices are growing before the war, okay? And that we should not forget about that. I mean, the war is just, you know, another trigger. But if you look at this graph, I will not get into the details because of the time constraint, but, but the prices were already growing. So then you wonder, so, okay, so what is going on? Okay, so, uh, and this is basically what I want to show. And if, if, if just to summarize, if you look at this price index of FAO, uh, you know, you already see that in nominal terms, even around 2015, you already see prices going up. And there are other issues that are going on that combine with the effects of a war that takes us where we are. And for example, if you look at 2015 and onwards, then there are issues related to how, uh, you know, exports are cut because of the weather constraint, the, the climate streams, all that stuff. Okay, so there are drivers that have been there for a while, and everybody talks about it, of course, it's not that this is new, but they are all interrelated, you know, they are all interrelated, that's what I will show. Uh, and of course, later, the war comes and makes things worse, but the, the point I want to make here is that, you know, we don't have to be naive and believe that prices are going up now just because of the war. No, there are being drivers pushing these prices up. And that's what I will be talking about uh, if I have the time, which I think I will have. Uh, now, look at this. Uh, this is the, the fertilizers again. And these are the prices of the fertilizers. Okay, the main fertilizers that some of them are supported by Russia. You see, the prices were also going up before the war. So, this is the message I want to pass. The war is very important, but the, the, the war for us is like a reminder that there are things going on there that needs, need to be tackled differently. We cannot just tackle them with short-term responses or war-related responses because they belong to major drivers of food insecurity and malnutrition in the world. Uh, and that's how the FAU is looking at these things. Uh, now, let me then move to the part that I wanted to move to. Uh, the, 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 the war, of course, is very important because it has effects in many, many domains. It's unbelievable. You just start, you know, digging down how this war is affecting the world. It has many entry points. 
it depends on also on your expertise and your skills. You would you would find an entry point for this. You know, it's interesting. You have uh, food and agriculture itself has a lot of problems because of the war. We've been talking about fertilizers, but also trade is a big issue there. The logistics, the infrastructure. I mean, some of the speakers spoke about that earlier on. I mean, you have disease. Nobody talks about it, but the war is causing disease. You have a humanitarian crisis as well. Okay, some people are dying. Uh, and then you have macroeconomic problems, okay? Because, you know, the traders are thinking about how to profit from this, you know, buy it in the futures, you know, it has a lot of repercussions, but it's very important that we keep in mind the following. Even though this war is of this magnitude, uh, the point I wanna make here is that the problems of global food uh, insecurity and malnutrition predate the war. I want to stress that many, many times here. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about that. This is the graph of the hunger numbers in the world. Unfortunately, I cannot show you the new ones because the state of food security and nutrition in the world is going to be launched on the 6th of July. So you will have this graph available with more updating numbers. But I don't need the update because it's only making me sadder, you know, uh, uh, and I cannot reveal the numbers either. Uh, but, but this is very clear. What I want to show here is that you may have heard about the prevalence of undernourishment, the POU. This is the indicator that the FAO uses, and it's also an SDG, Sustainable Development Goal Indicator, to measure the problem of chronic hunger in the world. It gives you the many millions in the world who suffer from hunger, right? And what this graph shows is that after declining for many, many years, around 2017, something happened, right? And the trend reverted. Gradually, you don't see it much, but if I, if I work with the rice scale, you'll see that hunger began to be on the rise, okay? And then it got worse, it got worse with COVID, okay? And of course, probably with the war, it will get worse. But the numbers are going up before the war. That's the point I want to make, okay? And this is where uh, the analytics needs to be uh, driving some evidence for us to understand what is going on. So. If you look at the regions, the same thing. Of course, with Africa showing the main changes in 2017, but you have the problem of hunger going up all over the world in all regions of the developing world. At least we're talking here about middle-income countries and low-income countries. Uh, so now FAO also produces an indicator that we call moderate or severe food insecurity. And this indicator shows you a problem that goes beyond hunger. It shows the problem of people who don't have hunger, they can eat, but they eat very regularly and they don't eat the right things. Okay, so they are not eating well. So even if you look at that indicator before the war, it was going up. And interestingly, here is not only about developing countries, but if you look at Northern America and Europe, you have food in moderate food insecurity going up. Meaning that people, some people, some millions, you know, don't have regular access to nutritious food. Okay, so it's not only a problem of hunger, but also a problem of food insecurity beyond hunger, what we are observing in the world. And just another statistic, if you look at the last two bullets there, we have found out that 3 billion people in the world cannot afford a healthy diet. A healthy diet is a diet that is diverse. It has everything in it. It has cereals, it has meat, it has, according to the guidelines that exist for that. But 3 billion people in the world cannot afford a healthy diet. And this includes developed countries. So then you wonder, what the hell is wrong here? There's something really seriously wrong. Of course, the war reminds us that there is a problem, but I'm trying to tell you that before the war, the war there was a problem. If 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet in the world, there is a problem. Now, I'm not showing, I'm not even daring to show you the malnutrition indicators in the world. Because what you will see there is that there's a lot of obesity going up, you know, overweight in children. So it is, not, it is not typically the problem of undernutrition that we spoke about, right? But also overnutrition. So we call that the multiple forms of malnutrition. And that, that is also a little bit scary. Okay, so why is that happening? It's not because of the world. 
but it's because of the key drivers of food insecurity and malnutrition in the world. And we have identified various of them. Okay, so here you have the drivers that are external to the food system. We call them the external drivers to the agri-food systems, but these include, and here is the guy that we have been talking about today for a specific instance, which is the war in Ukraine. That's how I have to call it, the war in Ukraine. Okay, from being a new UN agency, that's how I have to work to call it. But conflict is one of them. So it's not this conflict, but it's many conflicts that we have seen all over the years that are explaining the reversion in the trend of hunger. Conflicts all around the world, in Yemen, in, in many countries in the world. They are a key driver of food insecurity in the world. So conflict is one of them. The other one is climate variability and streams. Okay, that's the other second key driver. Uh, and then a third one is economic slowdowns or downturns. And people don't talk about them anymore because climate is, is, is an issue. But any economic slowdown in, in a country will lead to food insecurity and malnutrition. Example, the COVID-19. The COVID-19 resulted in measures to contain it that basically disrupted food value chains, you know, and the economies. And that by itself is a problem. Uh, so those are the drivers uh, that we call externals uh, to the food system, uh, but there are also drivers internal to the food system. How we produce, you know, uh, we waste a lot of food, you know, we waste a lot of food. Agri-food systems have inefficiencies and that makes the cost of the healthy diets higher compared to incomes. And that's a problem of affordability for 3 billion people in the world. Okay, so there are a lot of things to fix, but let me let me talk a little bit about the major drivers. And then, of course, this there is a problem here because these major drivers are increasing in intensity and frequency. Okay, so that's another problem. Second problem is that they interact. You know, there are countries in the world where you have climbing streams going on with conflict and economic slowdowns, and that is really creating a picture that is difficult to tackle. Now. These drivers are also very dangerous because existing inequalities in the world made them more powerful to affect people. Okay, so if those structural inequalities were not there, perhaps we could handle a little bit better the, the situation. But existing inequalities are making that some people cannot just cope. Some governments don't know what to do because the problem is structural. Okay, so these, these are the drivers. Now, very quickly, I show you some numbers on this. POU, the hunger numbers, that are very interesting to see. For, the, for example, in this graph, you see the, the dotted line. This, this is the prevalence of undernourishment for middle and low-income countries who have not been, so to speak, affected by these drivers. So you see the green one is basically going down. Then, of course, you have a little increase because the pandemic came and so on and so on. But these guys, look, they have been somehow exempted from this powerful drivers. But if you look at the others, look at the differences. If you see the first one is, I believe that one is economic slowdown, the first one. Look, the countries who have experienced economic slowdown have seen the prevalence of the nourish going up quickly, conflict and so on. And that's what needs to preoccupy us. Okay, how do we solve these things? The war is very important because it's one driver, the conflict, but you have the other drivers. Now, more interesting numbers here, if you see, for example, this is number of countries who have been affected by these drivers. Again, if you see, for example, the, con the countries with economic slow downturns, climate and conflict together, then the POU, the prevalence of undernourishment, goes up quite a lot compared to the countries who don't see them, you know? So what do we do here? It's complex. It's very, very complex. And uh, in terms of healthy diets, you see that even in terms of the affordability of healthy diets, these are people that cannot afford a healthy diet, it goes up when all three drivers are together. Okay, so you have a problem of structural drivers that you need to really tackle if you want to address the issues of food insecurity and malnutrition in the world. So uh, now on the world, I don't want to underestimate what the war means, okay? Don't take me wrong. All I'm saying is that the war is part of a driver that we have been talking about since we launched the state of food, the food security in the world, 2017, which was conflict. 
in that, in that volume, we explain what conflict means and how to build resilience against conflict. It's not easy, okay? And if, if you take the conflict, and these are the prevalence of undernourishment under numbers, if you take the base, is how we projected, it was going to decline, but don't be happy because this is not the zero axis, okay? This is, this is still, uh, you know, around 700, 700 million people in the world with hunger, but it still was going to decline. The war under different scenarios, so, some scenarios that are very harsh on how exports are restricted. Some of the speakers very well explained that, what exports, how exports could suffer. A moderate or even a mild scenario showed that many million more will fall into hunger because of the current conflict. So that basically adds to the problem, okay? But it's not that it's new. That's what I'm trying to say here. Uh, and of course, if you look at the world, this is the moderate scenario, this is the world, and what you have on the left-hand side is the percentage change in the number of undernourished, okay? So you see the blue areas, the blue, the dark, and the light blue are those that are more affected. This is, an, uh, uh, but the, other, the others are affected as well by, 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 by lower percentages. This is the mild scenario. If you take the, 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 the stronger scenario, then a lot more will be in hunger around the world because the conflict has global repercussions, right? Okay, so now, th then what do we do? Okay, and this takes me to the final part of my presentation. Uh, what do we do with this? It's very complex. Honestly, it's very complex. And we cannot neglect that a short-term response is needed. That is for sure. And that is consistent with my other fellow speakers have been presenting here. Uh, but these are not new things. Even you take textbooks, many of the things that you have here are there as well. Uh, and that's why sometimes it's funny to look at these things because the recipes have been there, but you know, but we need to talk about it again. Anyways, uh, so, so in the short term, what at least the FAO and the UN has been recommending is obviously one aspect that is critical is to keep trade open, okay? And that's why uh, one of the speakers also talked about the sanctions. You know, the sanctions try not to touch agricultural trade because it makes, makes sense, but there is also a lot of export restrictions going on, right? Uh, so that's a problem. That is a problem. Uh, it's important to review these sanctions. I mean, obviously, the sanctions need to be analyzed. We spoke about sanctions, but they need more research. What are the pros and cons? What are the costs and benefits? Because it's not so obvious who is losing and who is winning. It needs more study. Uh, it's important to avoid policy reactions that are, you know, from the gut, because then what you end up doing is protecting trade and, you know, you think that you are really protecting your consumers, but actually you are harming your consumers. So export restrictions should not be there because, you know, it basically harms everybody. Diversity of food supplies. I have a slide, I don't know if I can show you, but it's important to show that if you have more redundancy in the way you supply food to your consumers, even at the cost of efficiency, it makes a lot of sense because when there is a disruption like today's, you have a better buffer to survive the chalk. But anyways, it's important to diversify food supplies. Okay, very important right now in the short term. Uh, now, nobody talks about this, but it's important to prepare for disease outbreaks, even in Ukraine now, but it's, it's the, the, the war just basically takes you there. Prepare for nuclear risks, prepare for, uh, this is something FAU is now working a, a food facility, but it's important to have the, the international community to work about to, to work around having facilities for food, fuel, all these things to, to, to tackle the problems and the issues. Uh, obviously, the humanitarian response is critical, but we cannot rely only on humanitarian you don't develop, right? And that's the point I will make in my, in my, in my next slide. And so on and so forth. Now, what I will skip this one. How much time do I have, Chair? Oh, uh, you, are, you are into it? Okay, I see you, you are now following, so it's good. Uh, <laughs> No, anyway, no, this is, this is just a graph for an indicator that the FAO uh, uh, published last year in another report that we call the State of Food and Agriculture. But it's very interesting because it basically, uh, we call it the Dietary Sourcing Flexibility Index. Uh, and and we, we calculated it for 153 countries. Uh, and basically what it, what it does, it captures the, the multiplicity of different pathways 
through which a unit of food can be made available to a consumer in a given country. So basically you have here three sources of food basically. One is the diversity of domestic production for the domestic market of exports. You know, an avocado in my country, Costa Rica, can be either sold domestically or could be exported, but that's a source of food. Uh, the second one would be the diversity of imports and trade partners. This is very important because what, what I show you in the beginning with the first slide is that, you know, Russia and Ukraine can take over, you know, 50% of some flowers uh, uh, trade. So we don't have that in the, in the world right now. And that's something is important to have the diversity of imports and trade partners. And the third one is the diversity of food stocks held from the previous years. So stocks are very important. So let me skip to the second point I want to make about this. What it shows is that, and you have these sources here, and we, we just put a few countries, but we have 153. So you have, you have Japan at this side, but in terms of the index, it's not very different across countries. What is important is the composition, how these countries are supplying food, right? Uh, and, and it shows that countries have very different ways of ensuring diversity uh, in the food supply. Uh, but it also shows that generally, diversity in trade partners can provide substantial capacity to absorb shocks. And that's the point I wanted to make here. You see a, a country like Japan or South Africa, they have more diversity of trade partners, so they can absorb a chop, you know? But we have some countries in the region that are of interest for this activity in, in, in North Africa, for example, that don't have that. And if there is one disruption, that's it. That's it for them, okay? So this is very important. Uh, now, these data are pre-COVID, okay? It stops in 2018, if I remember correctly. Uh, so it shows that the war in Ukraine then highlights that, you know? When two key players, when two key players uh, 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 for global agricultural food systems disrupt global food supplies, and you don't have this diversity, then you have a problem. The world has highlighted that. Uh, and that's a point I wanted to make. So what FAU is recommending then is uh, six pathways. I cannot get into these details, but we will share the presentations, I guess, and I put nice notes there, expecting that you would like to see the notes because that explains. But the drivers, are structural and you need pathways that are structural. And in some countries, the pathways will have to be more than one. If you have a country that have conflict and climate, then you need, you, need, you need various things in that context. For example, you need pathway one, which is you need to integrate humanitarian development and peace building policies. And that's not easy. And if you have, if you have climate issues there, you also need to scale up climate resilience across agri-food systems. So it depends on the drivers then you, you, you need to undergo these pathways. But these are structural issues. If we don't tackle this, or if we don't go into these directions, then conflicts will continue to create these disruptions, okay? Now, it's not only about the agri-food system because we can take these pathways, but it's more complex than that because, because you need to work with other systems, okay? So what I have here is, it's not just the pathways themselves, in the agri-food systems, but you need a portfolio of policies and investments because these are structural issues and you need other systems, okay? You need other systems. For example, you need to, you need to tackle food losses and waste. You need to develop you know, energy, renewable energy to have cold chains. So you need to work with other systems and you need governance and institutions. So it's as complex as this is, okay? So let me then conclude uh, in summary, three points, uh, moderator, and basically, we have less than a decade to 2030, which is the, the year to apparently, you know, turn hunger into zero, into a zero number. That's SDG two, right? Uh, and the world is not on track. We are just not on track to ending hunger and malnutrition. We are not on track. Uh, maybe we have never been on track, you know? Uh, and in the case of the world, hunger is moving in the wrong direction. The COVID pandemic first, of course, and now the war in Ukraine are just the tip of the iceberg. They are, they are just the tip of the iceberg, and, and it is even more alarming that the major drivers online or or during this presentation are increasingly occurring with more power and more intensity and more uh, recurrence. Uh, but we know what needs to be done. At least the FAO knows what needs to be done, and we are working with countries in trying to transform the agri-food systems, following these pathways, depending on where you are in the world depending if it is conflict, the main driver, then you need to tackle it differently. Uh, and I will leave it here 
for the time for the interest of time thank you very much i have uh, the presentation was really good but i'm i think i really missed the role of like large agribusinesses you know in terms of this corporate capture of food systems and i feel like the first thing that fao if the policy is to increase trade increase export of fertilizers i i'm not sure that that's you know the way to go rather uh, i know that they also work for instance with lavia campesina or things like that you know movements towards food sovereignty amongst people of you know across uh, countries particularly in the global south i'm from india and um, yeah we have large amounts of uh, malnourishment undernourishment but corporatization is one of the key problems uh, so i'm really missing that perspective in the fao's policies which should be i think addressed uh, large agri businesses everywhere in the world are i think one of yeah, the primary drivers of these things I, well, my comment or question also um, related to that. I, mean, I found it a bit apolitical in a way. We look at domestic sectors, right? I mean, if I look at Central Asia, quite some of the causes of food insecurity and poverty are really in the domestic or in po political economy. So I think that should be, uh, well, basically uh, changed. And I know that it's often not what the FAO or the World Bank or, uh, want to do, right? To, to engage in, in domestic politics, but there's quite some things to solve there, yeah. No, obviously, I mean, when I mention trade, everybody's thinking of big, right? Not necessarily. I mean, I cannot go elaborate on trade, but, but if you want to diversify domestic sources of food, you need small farmers. And not only that, how you link up small cities and towns, in, for example, in Africa, rely on local capability of production, not the big markets. Obviously, when I talk about trade, everybody's thinking about international trade, but I'm th actually thinking about many, many players of all sizes. That's the only way you have these buffers. In Africa, for example, we have projects where it shows that the local food markets are the ones who are driving innovation, you know? So the trade, the trade in those, region, in those regions are very local and very small farmers oriented, you know? What is important to keep in mind, is this is all context specific, okay? And obviously there is a political economy issue there. I don't want to get into it, right? Uh, but one of the issues, for example, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't think, I didn't talk, talk about this right now. But the one question that we are receiving is, okay, fine, transformation, but we have an economic crisis. Where are countries going to get the money from, right? And one of the things we are now talking uh, very seriously globally is, well, you now spend globally. All the countries in the world spend more than $600 billion in agricultural policy support, okay? And the problem with this money is that it's not efficient. It only tackles a few products. Basically, in Africa, for instance, it's staple, so it actually prevents diversity and is not equally distributed because you have requirements for those policy support and the small farmers cannot get it. So we are very, very, very clearly passing on the message that you need to repurpose the current public budgets so that they, you know, the little money that there is in there can be invested where it should. And that touches upon all these issues. And yet there is the political economy. Because even some small farmers prefer that the country remains producing staples, right? Even a small farmers. So not, don't think that the, the, the political economy is only between big uh, versus small. But even within small farmers, it's difficult to convince some producers to move from maize or wheat, you know, to produce some vegetables. Uh, so yeah, it's complex, and, and and being a UN organization, we need to be neutral, you know. We need to, we're not only neutral, but evidence-based, <laughs> evidence-based. <laughs> okay. My PhD thesis was on nutrition, and I have an entire chapter on FAO, and we know how neutral FAO is. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we have the second uh, speaker, Dr. 
Tomaso Fernando, and uh, he's from, he's a research professor at the Faculty of Law, he's a lawyer, and Institute of Development Policy, University of Antwerp. Uh, his main line of research focuses on the link between law and food systems, with particular attention to the international dimensions, trade, investments, and human right to food. And the what happened? <laughs> and the definition of local practices, livelihoods, and ecologies. And so over to you. And the title is The Other Side of the Crisis, uh, Financing Food Insecurity. Thank you. Well, thanks thanks a lot. And thanks for, for having me, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's great to be here, to be back at the ISS after some time. And I learned uh, a lot today from the, all the conversations. And I will try to add my, my two cents to this, uh, to this dialogue and to uh, the overall uh, attempt that I think we're all uh, involved in, in, which is understanding better and moving forward in a meaningful um, way. So this is the slide that I just added because I was listening to Marco and I think that I, I do agree with him completely that uh, causes are systemic and there are roots uh, that we tackle to, we, we fail to tackle if we just think about emergency, if we just think about uh, the issue as uh, led by the war and in, if we think about urgent uh, reactions. But I also wanted to add a couple of points that sometimes I never really mentioned, which is like stocks of food are stable, if not increasing when it comes to wheat and corn. Um, production is not supposed to be failing that much this year. Actually, I was reading the last statistics. Uh, they're talking about 1% maximum of, of reduction, even taking into account what's not going to be exported by Ukraine and, and Russia with regards to, to grains. Some flour is a different discu discussion. Um, I think that there are other interesting things that we never talk about, like livestock using 80% of the land, producing 20% of the calories, and normal, like on average, using 40% of the grain that uh, is produced around the world. We're not talking about biofuels, which is like burning food instead of feeding people. Um, we're not talking about the fact that only 25-30% of the food that is produced globally is actually traded, and trade, and I think that Marco said trade is also intranational trade, but I think that we, when we think about you know, closing borders and stockpiling, the, the interest on trade and the, and the trade that the WTO, the FAO, and others are talking about is international trade, and we're only talking about 25-30% of the food, and mostly staples that are going into feeding animals or feeding cars. And also, and the question was just raised now about small-scale farmers, uh, if that's the case, who is really feeding the world and the people are feeding the world, so the small-scale farmers uh, who in certain countries of the world produce up to 90% of the, of the food available are not really those interested in this kind of global dynamics. So I also agree with, uh, with Marco that um, we're not talking about something new. Uh, we're talking about recurring issues and recurring instances. In the last 15 years, probably we saw at least three spikes uh, with regards to, to food prices. Uh, we've been seeing that uh, in 1996. We've been seeing that in, in 2008. We're seeing it uh, uh, now. So it's not something new, but any time that it comes out, it surprises. It, uh, it gets like uh, headlines of, of newspapers and journals. And it really seems that in the last 15 years, we haven't been really capable of addressing those systemic issues uh, that Marco was talking about, but also other systemic issues that I, that I think I can put on the table today. And one of the systemic issues that I want to put on the table today is the fact that while a lot of people are going hungry and while a lot of people have no access to food, not because it's not available, but because it's too expensive, uh, a bunch of uh, institutions and a bunch of people are making a lot of money. Um, there is a clear convergence between the picture that I showed you, which is the price of uh, food, and these other graphs, which shows uh, investment in futures of food. Uh, and futures is something that uh, may sound very complicated, and definitely as a lawyer, it like, took me a, a long time to try to understand what it is. Uh, but the origin of the notion of future is an insurance, uh, is a way in which producers and traders could somehow guarantee a certain price in the future, vis-a-vis -vis certain uncertainties. So it was introduced back in the days to make sure that in a certain time in the future, farmers would get a, a certain amount of money that was predetermined, but also the traders were not that exposed to the fluctuations of prices. So something that was there in order to help farmers and traders to smoothen the, the trade in commodities and with the, the establishment of the, of the food commodities market. Um, what has been happening uh, is that what used to be an instrument for food producers and food traders has become increasingly, if not predominantly, an instrument for speculators and people looking at food as any other commodity. 
and that is what I'm going to be talking about today. Not really everything coming from my brain. I must say that I'm really piggybacking on, on people who did uh, write a lot about that and did studies that are way uh, deeper than what I'm presenting today, also because Ona somehow surprised me with, the, with this uh, invitation on the basis of some uh, informal conversation that I had with someone that Ona knows, and then he, he reached out to me and said, oh, would you mind talking about that? So I wasn't expecting that, but it's, it's great because I, I just went back to a presentation that I gave in 2011, and somehow things still work. But I, if I have to point at people who have been doing a great work, I would say Luigi Russi, who wrote uh, in 2011, um, Jan Klapp and, and, and Ryan Isaacson, who have been writing recently on speculative harvest, and, and Janice, also part of the IHLPE uh, at, the, at the CFS, um, and Anna Chadwick as a, as a lawyer trying really to unpack what are the implications of, um, of futures and, and what it means to transform food into any other commodity. So what do we mean when we think about food as just another commodity? Well, we mean that uh, we can trade food, and in particular um, 18 key agricultural commodities, as anything else that you're following on the market. So as crude or as any other uh, item that you can just put an order uh, to a broker and then buy and sell whenever you want. Uh, you have that, uh, the commodities, and definitely these are all key commodities, but also these are the internationally traded commodities. And then we could open a separate conversation about the link between the internationalization and the globalization of the food system and the financialization of the food system, but that's another story. So what are the implications in, in very briefly in numbers? So implications are like 95% of the coffee that is traded on the market uh, every day is traded, not because people are interested in actually buying that coffee, but because people are interested in the fluctuations of the prices. So when it says 95% of the future do not have any underlining, that means that it's 95% of the time people are just hoping for the price to go up and down and they don't really want to have coffee delivered at their door also because it would be pretty bizarre to deliver tons of coffees in the middle of Wall Street. But when it comes to commodities and wheat in particular, the, the situation is even uh, more uh, intense. So this is statistics of 2018, so I didn't find the updated one, but one of these commodities, so this Chicago soft red winter, which is wheat, every um, year, what is traded on the market in terms of speculating or betting on the price of, of the wheat, is the equivalent of the annual production of that wheat. That means that every, there is 365 times more betting and speculating and investing than the market is actually uh, going to produce. And as I will tell you later, that definitely has an impact uh, and definitely is connected with what we're seeing today, which is a crisis of accessibility rather than a crisis of productivity. So as I said, like nothing of that is new. And what I did is I just went back to a report of the United States Senate. So it's not a radical left-wing uh, revolutionary organization. In 2009, they said, well, um, the speculative market and the trading in futures has really rigged the food system. And they're saying, already back in 2009, uh, they're saying there is too much speculative capital. Um, in the commodity market, and in particular, and they were saying that already in 2009, the wheat sector is the most speculated on. And, and they called, and they called for interventions. They called for some measures that the legislator could, uh, uh, could take. And what they wrote, and just keep that in mind because I will then mention something later, they wrote that there was substantial and persuasive evidence that by purchasing so many contracts, Index traders boosted demand, increasing the gap between futures and cash prices, and making it difficult for prices to converge when future contracts expired. So what's a lane person way of saying the same thing is, by putting a lot of money in hoping that the price is going up, so buying a lot of future contracts with a higher price than today's price, they gave the signal to operators in the food system that the price was going to go up, so there was substantial and persuasive evidence that finance was affecting the price of the commodities on the market. So that financial actors were not just providing liquidity, they were not just making it easy for food to circulate, but they indirectly persuaded all the food actors to push the prices up. So to actually make food less accessible and to trigger the situation that we saw in 2008, 2010, the, you know, the, the Arab Spring and so on and so forth. 
So nothing really new. And, and I think it's a sort of mantra that we repeat every certain years, like it, it is what it is. And, and, and the point is, if, if we keep considering that as a crisis, I think as Marco was saying, like the radical and, and structural solution will not be provided. But even if it's, everything is new, like starting around February, and in particular after the 24th of February and the invasion of Ukraine, uh, we've been witnessing again a narrative and a discourse and a projection of this idea of crisis. And I couldn't find any better way of saying that though, through the cover of The Economist, that you know, to, to, to pay due tribute to The Economist, in the article they mentioned that the crisis is a composition of different elements. It's not just the war in Ukraine, but it was pretty much signed around the invasion of Ukraine. So it's the invasion of Ukraine that is inspiring this idea of crisis, crisis and crisis. We're doomed. And, and certain moment also numbers, uh, and that's something that I maybe one day people will, will investigate and look at, numbers were presented in somehow a strategic way. So we, we, we heard earlier from, from Marco that Russia and Ukraine produce a big percentage of what is traded in terms of wheat and corn, a very large percentage of sunflowers globally. But sometimes numbers were presented as if what is traded, so 30% of wheat and corn traded in the world, were 30% of the global stocks of wheat and, and corn. And a lot of journals picked up, picked up on that, and Bloomberg picked up on that. And so there was a lot of reproduction of, of this idea that 30% of the food in the world uh, will not be available because Ukraine and Russia closed their borders. Well, it was 30% of the food that is traded in the world, which is all in all around 6 or 7% when we talk about grains. So that for me was, um, is meaningful and, and is telling of the fact that more conferences like this have to happen, but also that there are certain aspects of the food system that uh, benefit it. And some, some players who are constantly involved Behind, the, behind closed doors or behind curtains, curtains in the food system who benefited from what was happening and from this narrative. And I'm now gonna show you some, some graphs and some numbers and some very dense slides, but the overall idea is, is pretty straightforward. So you see that around the 24th of February, the commodity market for food became a terrain for speculation in a way that had not been the case for several months before, and for several years before, actually. And when I mean speculation, what I mean is that it was not, or not predominantly, people who were trying to buy the food who started putting money in the commodity market. It was people who had no intention to get wheat delivered. It was not the traders. It was not uh, a meal. It was not anyone who was actually interested in the food that started betting and hoping that the price was going to go up because, you know, because of the war, because of the crisis, because of climate change, and because of the way in which numbers were presented. And so you see here a sort of representation um, of how investment firms and investment funds, so non-food actors that uh, really don't want the delivery of the, of the goods, started putting money. And they started putting money, as you can see, and that's something that you know, also has to be, to be stressed, before February 22. So there is an intensification, but this idea that the food system was a rentable and a valuable place where to put money, also because of what Marco was showing us, the way in which prices had been going up, prices going up for certain people is good because prices going up means that when you invest in a future, in a future you're gonna make money. So if prices are going up, you invest money because you hope that the future is price will be higher, you somehow create a self-fulfilling prophecy that then becomes reality. And that is somehow also uh, confirmed that uh, the opportunity of the food system and the way in which food becomes a commodity is confirmed in any you know, business magazine or any investment magazine that you can read. So in the last months, people have been writing uh, articles like, like this one, like invest in food because it's, because it's good. Uh, and in particular, has been um, something that has been picked by the so-called uh, agricultural ETFs. And agricultural uh, ETFs is a sort of um, fund that uh, uses derivatives uh, in order to operate on the, on the market. So it's 
purely speculative. They have no interest in the underlying. They collect money from multiple investors, and then they bet on the commodities. And as you can see from, um, from this um, short text, the amount of money that is going into these funds and the amount of money that is going into derivatives uh, for food uh, has been rapidly increasing. And one example that is given, and this is a, a report by the Lighthouse Reports that came out uh, a few weeks ago. One of these funds is the Ucrium Wheat Fund, which is specialized only on wheat. Um, it uh, was trading 17 million. It was like, had an inflow of 17 million in 2016. Um, and recently it went up to 377 million. Um, so they are growing, they're attracting more money, and that is the uh, graphical representation of that. So this is uh, that fund that I was uh, mentioning to you, Teucrium, which is a very bizarre name. But you can see that, not surprisingly, the spike up in terms of investment and the spike up in terms of the money that the fund was receiving in order to invest in the commodities uh, overlaps clearly with the, with the invasion of, of Ukraine and reaching levels that had never reached before uh, since it was established and maintaining them. So it's not only about, well, I cover myself because there is the war, but I keep receiving funds and keep buying and keep uh, putting money in higher prices of the food, in particular of wheat, in the future, creating that self-fulfilling prophecy by which prices have to go up. And again, the fact that prices are going up and the fact that food is a, is a rentable commodity and the fact that it's good for investors to put money there is the narrative that Bloomberg is using. So that's how they define the, the fund. And they say that interest in the fund that's Clive, that's Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it's the grain shipments in the Black Sea. So it's like, well, like they occupy the ports, they cannot trade, so put money into this fund. So this is happening everywhere. It's happening in the EU. Um, out of 100 euro invested in this market, 72%, so 72 euros, comes from speculators, comes from financial investors. In the US, uh, the situation is a little bit better, but still we have, in particular for wheat, and do you remember this hard red winter and soft red winter that I talked about? 50% of the money going into that, uh, that commodity, 50% of the money betting or buying futures on that commodity are coming from speculators and not for people that are actually interested in the delivery. So if that is what is happening, what I think is, uh, is uh, interesting to look at is what is the mainstream response to that and then what has uh, been tried by some of the uh, jurisdictions that are involved. So the responses are always the same, uh, despite what the 2009 report said about the clear evidence and, and the clear connection between finance and the increase in prices. Um, investors and financial actors, they say that it is not because of finance. They say that their underlying causes are bringing up prices um, and that they're saying that, you know, you cannot blame finance. Actually, finance, what they're doing is providing liquidity um, and actually if you you know, break up on finance and if you break up on the commodity markets, that's going to have a, a very detrimental uh, impact on underlying dynamics. And I must say that that's the same response that I got from a colleague of yours, uh, Marco, from, from Maximo Torero. He was like making the same argument that you were making. Like these are all the causes and these are all the things. He didn't talk about finance. And then I was like, oh, what about finance? I was like, oh, to talk about finance, we should be seeing anom anomaly anomalies and we should see volumes in terms of financial investments that we are not seeing. Personally, what I showed and what the Lighthouse reports is, is talking about, I think, shows this kind of anomalous investments and anomalous dynamics in the uh, food commodities market. But uh, it's not really ever addressed uh, when we think about a structural problem and structural dynamics that should be tackled. So academics talk about that, as I mentioned. Academics are still talking about that. And they're asking, A, to take it seriously because for ethical reasons like speculating on hunger, but also for practical reasons. Like this is clearly uh, a situation that has been happening at least twice in the last 13 years that cannot be ignored. And some, some responses have been uh, promoted and proposed and the easiest way in which uh, regulators could be intervening is what is called putting position limits on certain commodities, which says if you are not 
uh, an actor of the food system. If you're not a trader, if you're not an elevator, if you're not a miller, you can't just expose yourself to that commodity beyond certain level because that exposition is, does, doesn't, is not justified by your actual interest and it doesn't bring any liquidity. It's just about speculative interest. So that was proposed already in 2008, 2010. There were some, some good campaigns about that. Um, measures were uh, undertaken, but uh, the Lighthouse report that came out recently that I invite everyone to, to have a look at just showed how the interest of the financial lobby intervened both in the United States and in Europe and watered down an actual meaningful interventions with regard to position limits to the point that both in the US and in Europe, um, the, the measures that we have are completely incapable of avoiding what is happening again. So there was a 2008, 2010, measures were undertaken, measures were undertaken in 2018 in Europe, for example, with the, with the MIFID, so with the Markets in Financial Instruments Directive. But then I just showed you that 72% of the money that is flowing into the commodity market in Europe is speculative market money, is, is money that is not at all interested in the underlying assets. Five? Three minutes? Perfect. So we have, again, 12 years later, new request to do exactly the same thing. <laughs> Let's see what's going what's gonna to happen. So there is a petition that was before the G7 summit. The G7 didn't do anything about that, but maybe, maybe it is going to be changing. But the point that I wanted to raise, the second point is, okay, so cool, speculation is bad and the people are putting money in the financial markets. We knew that and there are people writing about that. But what I want to say, and that links to, um, to a question that was raised now in terms of corporations and who controls the market, is that arguments about controlling the market and concentration of the market, and oligopoly and et cetera, have to be strengthened also by the analysis of the financial interest behind that. So just very quickly, that's what uh, I think Cargill has been doing the last two years. So last year, $5 billion of revenues. Bonanza, extraordinary, massive profits. Louis Dreyfus, another trader, one of the four ABCD, same thing. Um, this is ADM, the A of ABCD. Uh, you can see between the 24th of February and a couple of months later, they signed a plus almost 40% in their shares. Bangi, the same thing, so plus 40%. And that was like Bangi beats earning estimates, uh, beat analysis forecast, uh, and, and they did the best that they, that they could. And I, and I really like love the way in which they kind of say that they are benefiting from the fact that there is an invasion going on, but they don't say that. So they're like, why we incur losses in our Black Sea operation, we improve margins and volume, which is, well, we could actually increase the price and make up for the fact that we are trading less. That's, that's somehow what it is, but that's actually what they did. They increased the price, they make more money, not on volumes, but they make money on the margins that they are making. And so who are they? Well, you can't see it and I can't see it either. But so all these companies, of course, are companies that have investors. And I just give you a couple of names because they're familiar and then I think that I'm done. Um, so Vanguard and BlackRock in the case of Bungie. Um, capital research and management has 11%, the Vanguard has 9.5%, BlackRock 7% of, of Bungie. Uh, ADM, Vanguard has 10%, BlackRock 7%. And then, and with that, I'm really going to the end. It's not only about traders, we talked a lot about fertilizers. I think that it's important to, to know and understand that there are large financial interests behind a fertilizers based economy and a fertilizers based agriculture. And these large in financial interest are exactly the same that we talked about. So Vanguard, BlackRock, and all these asset managers, they own the traders, they own the fertilizing companies. And so if that is not taken into consideration, I think that we cannot get surprised that every 10 years, we're back to crisis, that every 10 years, the global food system based on fertilizers, trading, et cetera, et cetera, is in crisis, because there is no alternative if we don't really address this issues. Um, this is a German company. Um, you know, they've been making record profits in the last two months selling very expensive fertilizers. The first owner is Vanguard, the third owner is BlackRock. 
so then what? Uh, I wish I had the answer, but there is something that was tried in 2016, I think, in Switzerland, which I think would be game changer. It's not about you only blocking trading for speculators, but it's also about blocking or limiting commodity trading for traders themselves. So what they were saying is any company that is based in Switzerland cannot speculate on the food market. And if you think about most of the traders in the world, they are all based in Switzerland. So we have specific jurisdictions like Switzerland that have a key role to play in regulating or governing finance and all the issues that we've been, that we've been looking at. Why not thinking, thinking about that?